Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to our worship service today, July 16th. We uh, gathered here to worship the King. We're glad you could be with us. And we pray that what we do today will be pleasing to our Lord. A couple of announcements before we get started. We will have discipleship hour after the worship service, so there will be a brief uh, period of refreshments in between the worship service and the discipleship hour. But please stick around if you can for that period where you get a chance to talk to the pastor about uh, his sermon or other things that happen in the service, uh, whether they be readings or other things that we do. It's a good time to have access to the pastor. Uh, a reminder that on Mondays, the ladies meet for Bible study, so schedule that if uh, you would like more information to the floor is the contact person for that she needs it. Um, an announcement that's in the bulletin, and uh, I think it's the first time we put it out there, but um, on September 24th, Sunday, September 24th at 6 p.m., we will have a uh, special service uh, to commemorate our 30th anniversary of the, of the church. Um, we're asking, uh, we will be sending out uh, messages for RSVP so we can kind of gauge how many people will be in attendance. We're thinking it may be more than we can handle in, in the sanctuary here, so we may have to do something a little different. Uh, but, uh, please uh, put that on your calendar, September uh, 24th, 6 p.m., so that uh, we can gather together and, and celebrate what it's done. And just a, a quick uh, warning of something coming up. We'll be having a, a congregational meeting to vote on new officers. Uh, the date for that meeting is uh, being scheduled uh, and we worked out people's uh, travel plans and things like that to make sure we get everybody here. So that will be upcoming. Uh, we'll be having uh, three officers, three new people brought up to you, recommended for officers in the church. So having covered the business of the church, let's uh, prepare our hearts this morning to uh, worship the King. The meditation passage to prepare us for this is... Uh, Taken from Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Hear God's word. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, or of righteousness, or through the law that Christ died. No purpose. Let's take time to prepare ourselves for worship this morning. Stand for our call to worship. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saved and saves the crushed in spirit. Let's go to our Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather with fellow believers and to worship you. To worship you, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Lord, we pray that what we do today will be pleasing to you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be with all of us, uh, helping us to hear the word preached, hymn sung, and to draw closer to you through this service. We pray that everything we do today will be pleasing to you, glorifying to you. Amen. So let's uh, worship our Lord in the song. We'll sing together the doxology, hymn number 731. <laughs>
uh, continue worshiping through song by singing together hymn number one, All People and on Earth We Dwell. <laughs> Christ, 
have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. We are sinners saved by, by Christ and his grace. And our promise of forgiveness this morning comes from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's stand and we'll sing together hymn number 172. Let us love and sing and wonder. constant. You 
express that love when you send your son, Jesus, to live with us. He walked among us. He taught us. He showed us what true love looks like. He sacrificed his life to pay the price for our sins. As Jesus said, in, and it's recorded in the book of John, chapter 15, this is my commandment. One, what love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid out his life for his friends. And through his work, Jesus established his church as a place for all who believe in him to seek refuge, to find fellowship, to grow in the knowledge and love of God, his creation, and to worship God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This church, Covenant Presbyterian Church, we sum this up by saying that we are here to worship God, to grow in knowledge of Him through discipleship and to care for God's people through service. This morning we'll pray for the church, churches around the world established to worship God, and for this church established in Ledger, Connecticut, almost 30 years ago. Pressures from society challenge the work of the church, sometimes directly standing in the way, forbidding believers to gather, sometimes persecuting believers, and at times just slowly eroding the moral fabric so that God's teachings are questioned and people turn away. This morning, let's take time to pray to God, asking him to show his love for his church, <laughs> strengthening and encouraging the faithful to keep the faith and to stay the course. God has called us to. Father, we pray that you raise up godly men, men to walk alongside those already leading your church so that many workers can make the burden lighter. We ask that you would guide those who are called. Guide them, Lord, through your Holy Spirit so that they grow in knowledge and love for you. And we ask that you point them on the path that they should follow path of the challenge they face. Lord, we ask you to remove stumbling blocks from the path and help all, all of us who come alongside your workers to support them, praying for them, and taking on the work that we are able to do. All of this so that you may be glorified. We pray that all workers, Lord, that you've called, they be bold in proclaiming your word faithful and true to sharing the love you have for your creation. And Lord, we ask that you would grow your church through the work of your faithful. Father, we thank you for the men who have stepped forward to join the leadership of Covenant Presbyterian Church and commit to furthering your work. We ask that you bless and protect them as they seek to glorify you through this new service to this church whether they be officers as uh, deacons or elders, Lord, may their efforts make the gospel message proclaimed from this church even stronger. And may you be glorified by the work these men do in your name. Lord, we ask you to provide your Holy Spirit to them, help them to succeed despite the challenges society places in their path, allow them to grow, and may they honor you throughout their lives by wisely using their talents that you have provided for them to serve you, to serve this congregation and the wider community where you've placed all of us. And Father, this church is blessed by the many faithful people who gather each week to worship you and are dedicated to loving and serving you. The talents you have blessed us with are many and diverse, and we pray that we find good ways to use these talents each of us can serve you through service to the church, giving you glory. And Lord, your church is made up of humble men and women who face daily struggles, the daily struggles of life, caring for families, raising children, doing their best for their employers, and other challenges just too numerous to list. Lord, we thank you for the way you care for each of us. You know us, and you love us. Lord, help us to care for one another, 
Help us to draw closer to you as we care for those in our congregation, our circle of friends. And allow your spirit to help us as we face the challenges that arise. Intercede on our behalf. Guide our walk with you. And help us to persevere. And Father, it is a privilege to come before you in prayer. And allow each of us now to silently bring to you our own personal prayers and concerns. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to pray to you. And before we go to the Lord with the uh, Lord's Prayer, hear these words that Jesus said to his disciples when they asked him how they should pray. He said to them, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, Go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So brothers and sisters, let's join our voices together and pray using the model of prayer Jesus gave to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have the privilege of going into the inspired word. We'll start in the Old Testament in the Book of Lamentations. reading in chapter 3, verses 1 to 24. Once again, it's Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 1 to 24. Hear God's word. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. He became the, I have become the laughing stock of all people, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel. And made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope in the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. 
They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Let's turn over now into the New Testament and the, the book of 1 Peter. We'll read it uh, in chapter 1, verses 13 to 25. 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly <clears throat> from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news was preached to you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We uh, just recently uh, received in the mail one of those wonderful opportunities to serve uh, our government, uh, where we were summoned to uh, jury duty, uh, and uh, it is a it is a wonderful opportunity to serve, uh, and yet it kind of reminds you of the need for uh, juries because we live in a world where things aren't as they should be. Uh, there's conflict, there's people who do wrong, and there's a need to reestablish what's right in a courtroom. Um, I have never had the privilege of serving on a trial, but I have uh, been one of those people who has been invited to come and wait for a whole day to be told that you're not needed. Uh, and one of the things I noticed when I went in uh, is the, the, the building was so intimidating. I, I don't know, if, you know, I don't know which buildings you have been called to if you've ever been called to jury duty, but. The structures of many courthouses are grand, and the, the grandeur creates this somewhat feeling of intimidation, where you feel small and you feel like the thing you're going to is big. And the the judge is frequently at an elevated place in, in the black robes, and uh, and all of those sort of work together to create this sense that the thing you're doing is really important. It has weight and, and significance, but also there's a certain impartiality that's intended to be communicated. There's a symmetry and, and beauty to a well-crafted courtroom. And as you see this sort of layout of the structure, it communicates to you that there is, there's justice. And while we know that our courtrooms don't always do justice, the ideal is presented in the structure and in the, the, the way it's communicated that there's this longing for, for justice. There's a longing that we live in a society that does right. That, that the people who are charged to lead, lead well. They do what ought to be done. They avoid doing that which is corrupt and evil. You know, they do the right and, and, and forbid and, and are repulsed by evil and even punish it when necessary. But this pursuit of justice, this need for justice and the need for a courtroom is really the imagery that the Apostle Paul has been presenting to us 
in a heavenly courtroom in which God is being exalted as the judge in the first three chapters of, of Romans, in which we're in the last section of chapter 3, where he just turns from his great indictment of why he's not ashamed of the gospel is because you need it. That there is a God who you're accountable to who judges impartially, and he judges the heart, and your heart is not what it ought to be. And, and so there's this indictment, this courtroom scene in where the, 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 the judgment is about to fall. And at this point in the letter, we, we start to shift toward the reason we need the good news and the good news itself. The, the, the indictment to the remedy. Uh, and, and here we, we sort of are moving into the, 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 the positive component of the good news. Why is it that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel? Why does he believe it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes? He is now moving into that positive affirmation of what, what we all need. That central thing that makes a church a church and that central thing that makes a Christian a Christian, without which you are neither a Christian nor a real church. He's now presenting what is the very uh, beginnings and fundamentals of the good news. It's Romans 3, verses 21. We're going to read to 28 uh, this morning. Uh, Romans 3, 21 to 28. I'll read it, and then we'll outline it and pray. Romans 3, 21 to 28. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So the opening portion of this, uh, Paul is presenting his universal offer of the gospel, that there is a righteousness that is manifest in Christ for anyone who believes. It is not for a specific subgroup of people, it is for anyone who would believe there is a universal offer. The gospel then goes from a universal offer to reminding the, the readers and us listeners now that there's a universal need. So this offer, which is offered to all, is presented to all who all have need. And there's no one who does not need this. And not only that, he articulates it as a one-of-a-kind sort of gospel that changes all the other ways that we have of thinking about what's a good verdict. It's a one-of-a-kind good news, a one-of-a-kind gospel. So it's a universal offer to those who have a universal need, but it is a one-of-a-kind gospel that is unrivaled and meets the need like nothing else. With that in mind, let's pray, and we will look at this good news. Lord, I do pray that as we come under the care of your word, that you, by your spirit, would bring these words on a page the words that are alive in our hearts, that they would bring us the life that they are intended to bring, that they would be those words that, that never fade, never perish, endure forever, the good news that is preached to us. May that be something that we behold and are impacted once again by, not as something that happened once when we first believed, but every time we are renewed in faith is something we cling to. May we be renewed yet again, or for the first time, by this good news. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the universal offer of the gospel, this is uh, a declaration that is 
for everyone and fundamental in the most basic of ways. The first two verses say this. For now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There's a variety of fundamentals in every in every discipline of study. So if you're in to mathematics, there is no way to do mathematics without arithmetic. If you are bad at adding and subtracting, it does not matter how good you are at calculus, you will get bad answers. There's certain things that are just fundamental to every every field. It's, it's true, of course, of medicine too, where you have the Hippocratic Oath, where there's a commitment to make sure you don't do harm. That's fundamental to all medicine. And, and similarly, in economics, there's supply and demand. If you try to do economics while ignoring the supply and demand, you are bad at economics. It, it doesn't matter how sophisticated you become at something, it is, it is the application of those, those things that are fundamental in all the variety of complex ways. And so while there may be a complex application and may require discernment that's very detailed and the more you become excellent at something, the more you see that as complexities. There are certain things that you go back to over and over and over again, and if you forget them, it doesn't matter how complex you are, you're, you end up being wrong. This is one of those things which is so simple. It is like Adam. It is like do no harm. It is like supply and demand. It is one of those things that you can learn in your very first lessons. And yet, it is something that applies over and over and over to everything, in every way, without exception. The gospel is that thing that starts, but then continues and ultimately leads you to the end no matter how mature you become. And Paul here is articulating, now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. He's just finished this case here of, of how everyone is a sinner and how the Old Testament over and over again, particularly in the Psalms, but also in Isaiah, shows that every single one falls short, that as God looks at the heart of every person, their heart in some way does not live up to what they should be. And, and one of the things that it says is the law shows us that we need grace. And, and I, one of the things I, I, I talked about last week at the end of the sermon was that there's three basic ways that we use the law. That the Old Testament law, and in fact all the rules of the Bible, function in three ways. The first way is that it, it creates a fear of failure. And there's a really, it, it, that can be really great, because if somebody wants to do evil and they're afraid of the consequences of their evil, they do less evil. That's a good thing. The other side is it, 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 it is a positive vision of what should be. It, it helps you to set goals of when you look at what excellence is and you say, okay, what should be? It's that guide of what should be. It helps you kind of set goals and, and pursue success. So the law shows you first, you know, there's consequences for doing evil, which will keep you from being more evil than you would be otherwise. But also, it, it shows you what should be. What are the basic rules of things so you know what, what ought to be? And, and, and so you, you can pursue success. But the third use is the one that's presented here by Paul. For he's neither saying, although it's true, there's a fear of failure, or saying that there's a, a, a call to success in the normative use of the law, but he's saying that it's, the, the law here is a schoolmaster, which actually is the most important component of the law. And the reason why it's the most, most important component of the law is because it is the thing that helps the others find their place. And what, what I mean by it is this. When you see that though you need the fear of punishment, you know, well, why would anyone need the fear of punishment? Well, because you want to do wrong. And you see the other side, why do you need a vision for what's good if you don't ordinarily want it? And so the law plays a third role where it shows us that we aren't quite what we should be. 
that we want what's wrong and we don't want what's right. And the law is forced, forces us to confront the fact that I don't want the things I should want. And in fact, I want things I shouldn't want. So there's times when I want vengeance. It's murderous. There's times when I'm not wanting faithfulness in an intimate way. There's ways that you want things that don't belong to you. There's times when you're not really convinced the truth is all that great. There's times when you just want what you want. And the law shows us that when we want what we want for wrong reasons, we find ourselves as sinners. And the, the third use reminds us that the other two uses reveal that you don't really want things as they should be. And, and that is such a, a, a devastating critique. Why do you even need it in the first place? And, you know, there's two ways that we always fail. One is you don't do what you should do. The other is you do what you shouldn't do, right? You know, omission and commission. And in fact, every courtroom that you enter, for every reason that you enter, it comes down to one of these two things. Every single time, whether it's whether it's going for criminal, a criminal court, civil court, contract, every single time there's a case, it's judging one of these two things. One, did you fail to live up to the terms? Did you fail to do what you should have done? Did you neglect in some way that you either deserve punishment or payment? Did you do what you were supposed to do? Or did you do some crime or something that violated the terms? In contracts or even in criminal cases, did you do something that harmed someone else that did wrong to someone? Every single, every single time it's one of these two things. Did you do what you should have done or did you not do what you shouldn't have done? But omission and commission every single time. And the schoolmaster of the law shows us, did I do what I was supposed to do? Did I do something I shouldn't have done? And again, the whole of this argument that Paul has been laying out is every single person is before God who judges justly, impartially, perfectly. We all know we're accountable. We all have a sense of right and wrong, and we all fail to live up even to our own standards. And so at this point in, the, in, this, in Paul's case, he says, a righteousness from God has been made manifest. And that's, again, Paul here writes something like a philosopher. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you've ever read philosophical, you know, writing by philosophers. They're so dense, they're hard for us to understand. They're profound, and once you understand what's going on, you realize the simplicity and profundity is amazing when it's done well, of course. And this, is, this couldn't be done better. And so when he says, a righteousness from God is revealed, that's the language of saying, there's a perfection that God has judged to be just as it's supposed to be. Never erring in doing what it shouldn't have done and never failing to live up to everything it should have been. God looks down and he found something perfect. As he looked over the whole of the world and he stands in judgment and he says, what in the, what in the world here is perfect? And he's saying, I've found, I see something, I've judged something, perfectly judged it, and I've found it to be exactly as it should be. You know, you look at anything, and you just, the more discerning you are, the more error you see. You know, there's just no way around it. The better you become, the more discerning you become, the more you're able to distinguish how many flaws are actually in front of you. And God looks down, and, he, and there's, a, there's a righteousness that he sees. He sees something, in fact, he sees someone, who is exactly as he should be. It is, a, it is a rightness from God, a perfection from God, something that is just as it should be. And of course, he says, this is Jesus. And then, just as he says, there is a Jesus who is perfect one who has reflected God's righteousness perfectly. He then goes on to say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> right? I mean, he creates this contrast in which he says, 
I found something perfect. The perfect judge found something perfect. And then he turns his gaze to us, Paul, to the Lord of us. What about you? How do you measure? And, and here, I think, emotionally, where he says, there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, he transitions from this universal offer, look, here is one who's righteous. Look at him. To, let's look at you. And he goes right back to this. And he says, you're all one. He says, we're all one. You know, and, and I think as you as we read this, one of the things that we immediately feel, at least many people feel, I would, I would say a majority of people feel, is this seems kind of extreme, right? It's like you think, really? Like, I don't know that I'm that bad. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think we feel it this way. And I, and I think part of the, the challenge of this passage is Believing that God looks at us and finds us wanting. Do we believe that? You know, and, and I, I think on the surface it's sort of repulsive. And I think part of the reason why it's repulsive, we don't even want to believe it, is because if we start to believe it, we, want, we wonder what rabbit hole we go down. Like, will we spiral down to, like, you know, how bad am I? Is this actually a way of self destruction where you go from thinking, well, I'm bad, well, I'm worse, I'm terrible, I'm condemned, I'm awful, I'm hopeless. And I think there's a fear we each have when we start to say, am I really in this great need? Am I really undesirable? Am I really worthy of condemnation? You, you, you start to wonder, like, is this a downward spiral towards destruction that isn't good at all? And, and I think that fear is what drives us to, to put up walls that keeps us from being honest with ourselves. I was, just a very simple illustration, I was, a friend of ours posted a video on their social media of their, I think it was probably two, maybe three year olds, they were very young. And they had done something they should not have done. I think it was stealing or lying or whatever. And, and, and they were trying to get the child to say, I was wrong. Very simple. Three words. <laughs> and they would they'd tell the child, you need to repeat after us, I was wrong. And their response was throwing themselves on the ground crying. I can't do that. You know, they were just screaming and wailing. And, I was like, okay. and, then, and then they would say, okay, We'll, we'll call this little boy, you know, Michael. He wasn't Michael, but, uh, and he said, Michael, say hippopotamus. And he'd say, hippopotamus. And then they'd say, Michael, say, I'm, I'm sorry. No! Ah! <laughs> and then they'd say, okay. And they would pick these multisyllabic words, and they'd say, say it, and he would say it. It was this incredibly bright kid. And then they'd say, I was wrong. Ah! Like somebody was torturing this poor kid. And it was just hilarious, <laughs> right? Uh, it was this humorous clip. And yet, and yet, that's the sum of things that kind of lead to self destruction. Like when you can't start with acknowledging that you may have done something wrong, you can never turn from that. You can't turn from being wrong if you can't admit you did. <laughs> And so this, this is actually the way that you end up spiraling downward, not by admitting you're doing wrong, but being unable to admit you are wrong. And it's, it, it's, it's part of our nature. It is hard to admit that you're wrong, because you fear that once you do, you don't know where it's going to stop, and you don't know if it's going to lead to healing or self-destruction. And so it's very hard. It's very hard to admit that you're wrong. And we all feel it. And yet, when we say, what is the gospel? Most people use something very similar, similar to what's called the Romans Road, right? And the Romans Road essentially is a collection of passages from Romans which people can quote that, that show certain high points in the book that shows you the argument that Paul is making of what is, in fact, the good news. And the beginning of this is this verse. All 
have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the starting place. We're all there. There's no one who's not. When you raise the standards to the level that God wants them to be, you don't hit them. The only way you can hit them is if you lower the standards and you make them maybe your own. And even those, you don't usually hit. In fact, most of the time, we don't make our own goals. And so even when we lower them to our own standards, we know we don't measure up. But it doesn't end there, of course, because we're reminded that there's a, a gift, a gift from God, freely given. I, uh, I was reading in preparation for the sermon this week, and I read about this tech worker. He was in the he was out in Silicon Valley, and he tried to get a job at one of the major tech companies, and they didn't hire him. And he was pretty disappointed. He didn't, so he was he was passed over. You know, he, he, you know, you send your resume in, and you say we, we measured your resume and found you wanted. Uh, and so, as a result of of his resume being rejected and him not getting a job at the tech company he wanted, he decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to work on the project that I thought I should work on. And a number of years later, after his project was completed and he had built his own company, he sold his company to the company he tried to get a job at. And he got something close to $16 billion for his company. He was, he was rejected and it looked like it was really bad news. But in God's working in ways that are in common providence, it worked out for the very thing that he probably needed. When we realize that we are sinners, it feels like getting fired. It feels like getting a, a, a resume that's put, turned over and, you, and your resume is looked at and you say, we don't want you. And we, whenever we admit that we are sinners, it seems like it's it's like a resume that's presented that's rejected. You're a failure. You're not wanted. You're rejected. And, and that visceral reaction of feeling unwanted, that visceral reaction, reaction that comes from knowing that you deserve to not get it, can feel like bad news. And yet, in fact, it's really the only way to move toward the good news. It's the only way to move in the direction that you ultimately need to move. And the passage moved from the bad news, all of the sin and the short of the glory of God, to the good news. And the good news is you can't trust yourself, but you can trust someone else. And in verse 24, here we we'll keep moving through the passage. All, false, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Grace as a gift and faith in what Jesus has done. Who he is, what he has done, received by grace through faith in Christ. And if you cannot get to the place where you realize you cannot trust yourself, you'll never put your trust in the one who actually can save you. Bonhoeffer, a number of years ago, in, 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 uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a theologian in Germany during the rise of the Third Reich. And Right in the middle of this rise, he wrote a book called uh, The Cost of Discipleship. And in this moment of great social turmoil, in which he was so disappointed with, with the church and its licentiousness, he coined this language of cheap grace. And in, his, in the opening of his book, he says, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. You see, we don't really ultimately put our trust in grace. I'll say that again. Ultimately, we do not put our trust in grace. We put our trust 
in the God who is gracious. And that difference is, that, that makes all the difference. Is it grace that saves, or is it God who saves? Grace ultimately doesn't save. It's God who saves graciously. It is Jesus who saves graciously. In fact, grace is the only way it comes to you, but, but it isn't grace at first. It's, it's God first. God is the one who saves, and you behold him. You are connected to him. You receive the benefits of God by grace. And the temptation is to think, well, if, if that's the case, you know, aren't you going to become one who holds to cheap grace, right? Aren't you going to become the person who says, okay, the way that you are saved is you have to stop trying to save yourself. Well then, aren't you going to become a sinful mess, right? Aren't you going to move from... Well, well, if God's gracious, I'm, I can do whatever I want, I'm going to do whatever I want, and I'm going to sin. Doesn't that make perfect sense? And in fact, it makes perfect nonsense. Because if you behold God, and you see that he is in fact good, and you in fact want him, you want the things that he has. And grace is not a way to free you up to be content to sin. No, grace is the way of which you're strengthened to repent. It is not a, a, a license to sin. It's, a, it's, a, it's an empowerment to repent. And Bonhoeffer knows this. He sees like, well, how can we repent? And why is it that grace is the only way that leads you to repentance? And the reason for it is because the, the problem is your self-righteousness. And so Paul is saying, your problem is you're trusting in yourself. <coughs> and so let's say you do really bad things, right? And you don't, you can't save yourself, but you're not, you're not beholding God. You are trusting your own way of living. Or if you do things really, really great, and you live per like excellent life compared to your peers, you trust yourself. And back to the civil law, or the omission and commission, the law. When you look at the law and you say, what keeps me from obeying the law? One, I'm afraid of bad stuff's going to happen to me. Or, if I don't do the law, there's really good things I'm going to miss out on. So either bad things are going to happen to you, you're, you're fearing punishment and, and harm, or you fear missing out on something great. So you either fear the punishment or fear missing the reward. Both of those are really about you. And at the end of the day, just you end up saying, God, how do you get used by me? You don't stop being selfish by keeping the law. You don't stop being self-righteous. In fact, that's one of the best ways to indulge self-righteousness. I am worthy because I have done great things. In fact, you could, might even be, I am worthy because I am so good at repenting. <laughs> I know it sounds silly. We do. Bonhoeffer here is saying, grace, real grace, connects you with the real God. He's really good. And when you see that, you turn from your sin, whether it be self-righteousness or just licentiousness, and you turn toward the God who's good, because you see that he's good. You love it, and you move forward. So you stop being motivated only by fear, fear of missing out, fear of punishment, and you start being motivated by love. What a great God this is. And the commandment, ultimately, isn't, Don't do wrong things. The commandment ultimately is love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the only way to get there is to, to see the goodness of God and have your heart changed. Far be it from a way of keeping you from doing the law. In fact, it's the only way to do it. You cannot do the law until God intervenes by grace in your heart to show you how great he is 
And then you want to love him. Because he's loved you. And there's really no other way to keep the law. You can't keep it yourself. And Paul's indictment here is driving this point home. There's only one way. And it's if you stop trying to do it yourself and you let God do it for you. And again, you say, well, am I supposed to stop sinning? Yes, you're supposed to stop sinning. <laughs> you cannot love God and keep sinning. It doesn't work that way. But you can't trust yourself and get good enough at it. It's something that God does. Graciously, powerfully, effectively, He's the one who transforms your heart. And the good news is that He does. He does change your heart. He does show you His love. He has intervened in creation. He has brought perfection into our world. A righteousness from heaven. And when you behold God's perfect judgment, you see one who is both just and the justifier of sinners here. This is what shows God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance. He had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There's two, there's two things that go wrong in all of our lives. One is... You, you sort of justify sin as, well, no one can be perfect, right? Have you ever had somebody do wrong to you and they say, well, nobody can be perfect? That's a really satisfying apology, right? <laughs> and the other way that you can go wrong is, is to have no way back, to have no hope. You've seen your evil, you're condemned. How do you not do one or the other? One, lower the bar and be okay with sin, or keep the bar high and condemn everyone? Because God has a heavenly courtroom, and he cannot judge unjustly. He cannot look at your heart and say it's something that it's not. He is an impartial judge who judges perfectly, and as you enter a courtroom that is a heavenly courtroom, and you stand before him, and he looks at your heart, and he knows exactly what he's looking at, well, you say that's just as it's supposed to be. Come on. And the answer is, of course not. Of course not. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how is God both just and the justifier of sinners? Because He brought perfection into the world, and He brings that perfection into your heart. And there is no other way. God has to do it. He is the only one who can and does. And that is the good news. That God can save even you. And if you don't believe that, you have to have a higher view of God. Because when you see God as really holy, you do feel sinful. But when you see God as really gracious, you know He can forgive you. And you see that perfection came into the world, and He lived just as you should have lived. And he died just as every sinner should have died. He suffered condemnation on a cross for you and me. And God was so pleased with him, so delighted, saw so much perfection that death didn't hold him down. He was greater than sin and death. And for that reason, he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. So when God looks down at you and sees you in Christ, he says, perfect. Not because of you, but because of him. And you see, at the end of the day, any church is really a church. Any Christian is really a Christian because they're in Christ. And there's no other way. You cannot earn. You cannot change your own heart. You cannot do enough good deeds to make the evil that has been done go away. You cannot undo the past. But Jesus can. And that is the good news. And so when Bonhoeffer moves from cheap grace, he moves to costly grace. And he says it is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sin. Above all, it is costly because it costs God his life, costs God the life of his son, ye were bought at a price. 
and what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is a grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us all. So then, what comes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By the law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You can't do it. I can't do it. And when you try, you mess it up. There's no way to do the gospel good enough. You need to receive the rest. That's the fundamental. That's the thing from which everything else is built. He did it. He did it all. He did it for you. And your job is to trust him. That's it. And when you trust him, you follow him. Because you trust him. And then when you try to do it yourself, you repent. And then you trust him. Over and over, you trust him. And you know why? Because he's perfect. He always does it right. He is righteousness from God revealed, and he is at work in you to make you more like him. And that's good news. That's good news for sinners like us. And it ends with this. Do you then overthrow the law by this faith? No. Did I just pull it? Right, his head's going to explode. You, how can you even begin to think that what I'm saying is stop doing right things and start doing wrong things? How can you even begin to think that? It's like, you, you know, that R.C. spoke, what's wrong with you? You know, <laughs> no, it's, ah. Uh, you know, there's no way to come to that conclusion. A God who has done so much, how can you not say, I want to be like him? You can't. You can't trust him and not want to be like him. You can't do it. That's how you know you trust him. And at the, the, the Belgian Confession puts this beautifully where it says, We believe that this true faith, being wrought in man by the hearing of the Word of God and the operation of the Holy Ghost, doth regenerate and make him a new man, causing him to live a new life and free him, free him from the bondage of sin. Therefore, it is so far from being true that this justifying faith makes men remiss in a pious and holy life, that on the contrary, without it, they would never do anything out of love to God, but only out of self-love and fear of damnation. The gospel puts aside your fear and replaces it with love. And there's no other way to honor God. There's no other way to keep the law. In fact, this is the only way to do it. So I, I, can, I can say, God's going to punish you if you don't do the right thing. And I can tell you that you are going to miss out on all these wonderful things if you don't obey God. And those two things would be true. But they're not sufficient. Because they don't make you love God. They just make you fear. God wants much more from you. He doesn't just want you for selfish motives to do the rules. He does want you to do the rules. But he wants much more. He wants your heart. And the only way to do that is to let God change your heart from that selfish, self-absorbed, rule-keeping, or rule-breaking self. And trust his righteousness. And see the costly grace that is offered to you and let it change every part of you. That's where, the, that's where real spiritual power is found. And that's why Paul says, I am not ashamed of this, because this is the power that changes you. This is the thing that makes everything different. This is the stuff that keeps you from being whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. This is the thing that gives you a new heart and a new spirit. This is the thing that makes you have God say, well done, good and faithful servant. You are just like my son. And so John Newton, in his famous hymn, Amazing Grace, has this beautiful line where he says, Grace hath taught my heart to fear, 
and grace, my fears are deep. You see, grace shows you that there's a God whose judgment really matters. And it says, I got to fear him. He's the one who really holds blessing and cursing. That's where all my fears are pointing. I'm really, all of my fears ultimately are a fear of condemnation. And he is the only one who controls that. So where does all of my fear go? It goes to the God who is the real judge. But when you go to that, that God and you see him and you see that he has judged Christ in your place and he has offered you grace and he says, you are going to be mine and I'm going to make you perfect. I'm going to make you just what you're supposed to be. And when you behold that, your fears are relieved. Because you trust him. And that is the good news. And so as you enter the grand door of the courtroom of heaven, not as one who has had a science to be a, a juror, but somebody who has been indicted. A person whose heart is corrupt. And you stand before the throne of our almighty God who judges impartially and perfectly and he says what's your what's your plea? You have one. Christ has lived. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ is coming again. And he's coming for us. Let's pray. There is a righteousness that has been manifest from heaven. Perfection has invaded our imperfection. A world that is broken and dark has seen a light. And it is not our own. It is the gift of God. And I pray that once again we would behold this good news. And that we would in fact see it as good. And that we would be drawn to its beauty. And that the radiance of its beauty would transform our hearts by the power of your spirit. That we see you as the, the one who is just and the justifier of sinners. Of which we all fall short of the glory of God. Help us to rest and receive on you alone. And cast away self-righteousness into the depths of the sea. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together, all hail the power of Jesus' name. It's 296 in the middle of the stand of Tennyson. <laughs> So
is bad news that we are sinners, but it is good news when we stop trusting ourselves and we start trusting the God who can actually save. And as we come to this table, we are reminded once again that we are unworthy sinners, and yet he has made us worthy saints. That it is his work by grace through faith in Christ that gives us hope. And so if you know Jesus as your Savior, and you've made that public by, by joining a church that believes in Jesus, uh, this table is for you. We welcome you to come. Uh, if that's not true of you, we are really grateful that you're here, but we would ask that you let the elements pass. Uh, <clears throat> Matthew 26, 26 to 28 reads, Now as they were eating, uh, Jesus took bread, and after he blessed and broke it, he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, as we come before your table, your body broken, your blood poured out, we do pray that you would use these very common elements, simple elements of bread, wine, juice, in small measure. And yet, in these small things, we meet the grandeur of God who changes us by grace. Even in these small elements, we're reminded we can't save ourselves. All we can do is receive them. And I pray once again that that good news will change our hearts, renew us in faith, and energize our obedience, not for self-righteousness, but to give glory to the God who has been so gracious to us. Please use these common elements for your spiritual purposes to accomplish what you intend through us. Meet with us by your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, as the bread is passed around, it will be in little cups. Uh, please take uh, and eat when you are individually ready. In the same manner, he also took the cup, and having given thanks, he gave it to the disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. As the uh, cups are passed around, the outer circle is grape juice, and the inner circles are wine. Uh, please take as your conscience leads, and also please wait for everyone to be served, and we'll take the cup together.
Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let's pray together. We stand as we sing the glory of us. Chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, followed by the benediction, receive the charge. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Receive the benediction. May our triune God renew you yet again in the good news that though you are a sinner, we have a greater Savior. And may you know that and live that, and may that inspire the best kind of obedience. May our triune God bless you with this today and forever. Amen. Let's sing, may the peace of God. Oh, uh-huh.